I was going to give you two options, but my wife said, no, nope, take the options away. Just do the first one so people don't feel guilty when they want to choose option one, but they pick option two. <laughs> the sermon's going to be huge, and so what I'm going to do this morning is I'm just going to preach the first half of my message, which is only going to deal with the law of murder that Christ speaks. I'm going to cover the other two on lust, and adultery and divorce later this afternoon. So I'm going to give you an option, but you don't have to take it. This afternoon, I'm going to come back at five and I'm going to preach the rest. I'm going to ask the wonderful TV AV crew if they can either show me how to do it or record me doing it. And you get an option of you can come and be here if you'd like to be here or you can watch online or you could just choose not to watch it. That's really, that, that's, it's all up to you. Uh, but I want to get through the content. I want to remain in time. But it is content heavy what we're doing this morning. If you do want to come back this afternoon, I'm happy to make a whole other service out of it. You can do some worship or do a prayer. I don't really mind. But I'll be here preaching if you want to come along. But the option that I'm taking away from you is we're not sitting here for an hour and 15 minutes. Just, just said too much. Just, just back it off a bit. <laughs> but we begin this morning's teachings on how Jesus is telling his disciples to fulfill the righteousness of him. So remember that last week, Jesus' last words, and this is the problem when we cut the sermon up too much, we forget what we've just learned. But Jesus has just said to his disciples, look, your righteousness will need to surpass that of the Pharisees if you want to get into the kingdom of God. So he's looking at the religious leaders, he's looking at the general milieu of the, the Christian uh, culture, and he says... Or actually, they're not making it. And so if you want to make it, you're going to have to be far different to what the Pharisees are doing. And the reason is, is because if you're going to follow the Pharisee, if you're just going to follow the religious milieu, well, they're not actually following the commands of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, you're going to have to follow me. Yes, of course, we've been given righteousness by Jesus Christ through the forgiveness of our sins. And because we are now made righteous, we will perform the righteous works of Christ. Remember, we talked about this last week. If Christ is in you, then what will be produced in you? The works of Jesus. Because Jesus will not produce in you wickedness, will he? That's not the work of the Holy Spirit. That's not the work of Christ within you. Those that are made righteous will do the righteous work of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ this morning is teaching to his disciples. He's teaching to you who have come to follow him and to know him as your Lord and Savior. Here's the righteous path you are to go on, because if you don't, you're going to be in fear, or there will be a fear of the judgment that is for those that are trapped in hatred, for those that are trapped in lust. Now, as we come to this text this morning, what we're going to be facing is we're going to be facing the laws of Moses. And as we come to the law of Moses, the reality is of the law, all it can do to us is show us our sin. It shows us our unrighteousness. I remember asking my father about, about God and what it would be like to behold him. And he said, can you imagine a big white wall that just goes up and up and up and up and up and it just extends for forever and it's shining bright and it's perfectly white and you can't but def default help look at yourself and notice that the purity that is in it is not on you. And when you look at the law in its perfection, when you look at the Ten Commandments in its perfection, we can't help but then look at ourselves and go, well, I don't measure. I don't meet the standard. And I tell you that this morning because Jesus is going to say, you have heard it said, and he's referring to the law of Moses. What you're going to feel is you're going to feel guilt you're going to feel the weight of your sin this morning. These aren't going to be overly easy passages. But what I want you to know is that Christ did not speak these words to condemn those who follow him. He spoke these words for you so that you will follow the righteous path and not go the way of condemnation that many of the religious were going during his time. So it's for you to follow the right way. 
Remember from last week, Jesus looked at his disciples that have turned to him, who upon the pronouncement of the kingdom, he said, repent and be baptized. And they repented, they got baptized, they received the forgiveness of their sins. And he said to them, look, you are salt, you are light. You're not aspiring to be salt. You're not trying to be light. You are salt, you are light. You are the goodness of God in the world. And you are the one who is meant to be showing the world the goodness of God. That's who you are. Or in other words, you are the righteousness of God because Christ is in you. And because of that, be salt. Don't lose your taste. Because you're light, don't hide it under a basket. Because you are the righteousness of Christ, don't go into wickedness. Because it's not of Christ. So this morning, when you are confronted with the fact, as I am confronted with the fact, that we have been murderers at heart, that we have been adulterers at heart, that we have been failures in our marriages, sinning grotesquely before the Lord, what will you and I do? We will do what we did when we first came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We will acknowledge our guilt and our sin, and we will seek the forgiveness of our Lord and Saviour, and we will repent, we will turn from those wicked ways, and we will follow the Lord. Now, if you're someone this morning that's tempted to justify your behaviour for why you did what you did, to not want to follow the commands of Christ, seeking to self-justify yourself before God, you're living in rebellion. These scriptures of Jesus are here for disciples to rid themselves, to repent of the unrighteous ways of the Pharisees, to repent of the unrighteous ways of those that call themselves righteous before God, and to take up this path. What I also want you to know before I begin, and it will come as no revelation to you, I am a sinner. I just want you to know I'm not preaching down to you, I'm preaching the word of God. I have been a fornicator. I have had an adulterous heart and it still tempts me. I've lied to my brothers and sisters and I have not loved as I ought. And I say that so if there is any heart of criticism in you that I am sitting here belittling or making you feel small, I'm sitting under the same word of God that you are sitting under. And I just want to follow Jesus according to the way that he says, this is how you follow me. And I invite you into that process once again, to discipleship. I'll say one more thing before we hit the scripture where we're at this morning, and it comes from Acts 3, and it is Peter talking about Moses. Moses says this, The Lord your God is going to raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. If you have any intention to pursue Christianity, to call yourself a Christian without fulfilling or obeying or wanting to and yearning to do that way, Scripture says you're living in a way that God says, I'll cut you off. That's not me judging you. I'm just saying you're going to stand before the judge. And So right now I do speak against a mantra of Christianity where they say I live by faith alone or it's by faith alone that I'm saved and the way that that works out is you don't have to do anything except sit on your hands, I'm saved, sweet, I'll go do what I want. That's not faith, that's not a true interpretation. Faith is trusting in the word of God. Do you trust in the word of God? Well then it should be working out in your life. Do you trust the word of God? Then it should be working out in your life. To say I believe and do nothing, that's not belief. It's not belief. It's not faith. As we just heard this morning, what would James say? He will say, faith, if it's not accompanied by works, what is it? It's dead. It can't produce salvation. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's not faith. Faith trusts in the word of God. If we go to Hebrews, the people of faith, Noah believed that it was going to rain, so what did he do? He built an ark. Abraham believed he was going to be a great nation, but what did he do? He left his homeland. They were living by faith in the word of God, and you are called to live by faith 
by trust and obedience in the commands of Jesus Christ. With that, I now begin. And our single point that we will learn this morning is this, and it's on your pamphlet if you have it with you, as I didn't produce slides. The righteous fulfill Christ's reconciliation. That is the single point. The righteous fulfill Christ's reconciliation. So if we move now into verse 21, where Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, Do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. Jesus is quoting the sixth commandment of the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses when he wrote them on the stone, on the tablets. You can find them in Exodus 20 and, and in Deuteronomy 5. And I encourage you, if you do not know your Ten Commandments, commit the Ten Commandments to memory. Now, when the Scriptures talk about the law and when the law is brought up, it does not always mean explicitly just the Ten Commandments. The, the Genesis through Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, were all written by Moses. And by the Jews, they're called the Torah, or they're just called the law. So sometimes when Jesus says, you have heard it says, he's not just quoting the Ten Commandments, as was just spoken about earlier. Sometimes he's quoting from different portions of the first five books, and they're considered the law. For instance... The greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's not in the Ten Commandments. To love your neighbor as yourself, that's not in the Ten Commandments. And yet Jesus says that they're the greatest two commandments because the other ones flow out from it. If you love your neighbor, you won't murder them. If you love your neighbor, you won't commit adultery against them. If you love your neighbor, you won't covet their things and so on. So when Jesus speaks on the law, it's not the Ten Commandments explicitly, it's Genesis through Deuteronomy because Moses, who wrote the books, is the law giver. The second thing to note is that Christ is not starting new laws. He just told us last week, I've not come to abolish anything, I've come actually to fulfill. So he's not starting a new law, he's not bringing it up a notch, what he's doing is he's actually bringing the true interpretation of the righteousness that God's people were supposed to live by when they heard the law. When it says, do not murder, for instance, they weren't meant to go, well, how can I hate this person as much as I can without actually killing them? He's saying, no, the command was there so that you would love your brother and sister. That's what it was pointing forward to. And I want to show you an illustration of how their interpretation, how the religious Pharisees' interpretation led to an unrighteous fruit that God would call condemn. You see, the law, it states, and it says that once you murder, once you kill the person, in verse 21, once you kill the person, then you're subject to the courtroom. You have to go face the local court if you physically go and kill someone. However, in that law, you could get a technicality through. Because if you didn't murder them, but you produced the way in which they were murdered, well, then you're still righteous under the law. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did. When they conspired against Jesus, they knew that they didn't have any grounds. So they got people to lie on their behalf. They weren't doing the lying. They got people to lie on their behalf and say, he blasphemes God. And then what they did was they said, let's get the Gentiles who do not live by the law and we'll get them to put him to death. We didn't put him to death. They put him to death. Under the law, I'm still righteous. And so what the law now has done is it has increased in sins. You are looking for new ways and finding new ways. How can I get away with it? How can I work my way around this one? Instead of actually just following what the law's intent was for. Don't hate your brother. Don't hate your sister. So Jesus, this morning, and what he's going to do for the next two weeks as we work through these laws, is he's undoing these bad interpretations which bring about the unrighteous works which Jesus condemns and says to his disciples, don't follow in that because you'll go where they're going. Listen to me and listen to how I interpret them for this is what it means to fulfill these laws. 
You see, a heart of a Christian man or a Christian woman caught in the deadness of Christianity that can sometimes be there, that's what they say. They'll go, how much can I get away with and still remain on God's right side? That's a dead heart. If you have a heart like that, that is a dead heart. How much do I not have to do just to have God still on my side? When the love of God comes to us and fills us and we love God, the Christian wants to do what? They want to obey God. They love to obey God. They cherish his precepts and his commands. Because you cannot do the Ten Commandments without love. To love the Lord your God is the greatest. So if you don't love God, yet you're trying to follow the commandments, what are you doing? You can't follow them. In verse 22, Jesus interprets the righteousness of the law of murder and what God's people should have been doing. They shouldn't have been hating one another. And he says, hate in the heart towards your brother or sister in Christ. Jesus says, that's not an issue of the court. So if you murder, you've got to go to the human court. But if you hate your brother in your heart, God sees the heart motivations in you and, and you've got to stand before his courtroom. So the severity of murder might render a human judgment, but Jesus says, no, the severity of the hate in your heart renders a divine judgment. So if you are a Christian who hates your brother or sister who is also in Christ, you have the heart of a murderer and it is subject to condemnation, Jesus says. The question then becomes, how do we fulfill this righteous law? Well, it's easier said than it is achieved or done. John 1, 3, 15 says, anyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer and eternal life is not in them. If hate is what you hold and what you have in your heart towards someone, John says clearly, then eternal life isn't resting within that person. It's a contradiction because the righteousness of Christ, he loves his people, will produce a new what? Love for your brothers and sisters. Before we move on to how love is practically demonstrated, because he's going to do that in a second, Christ first deals with how hatred can be known within us. And what he turns to now is what in our scriptures this morning say in the CSB, insults insults, the, the, the cussing or the, the verbal abuse that we might hurl at one another. Now, in other Bible translations, it says raka. And what it is, is that there is an Aramaic word. We don't know exactly what it means, but we think it just means stupid or foolish or airhead or something like that. But whatever this word was in the Aramaic, meaning that it belonged to the Hebrews, they said it because they held their brother or sister in such contempt. And Jesus said, when you say that word, you have to go before the Sanhedrin to give an account. It was such an offensive word, it's kind of like those four-letter words that we know about that were just like, you don't say those ones. The other ones, but that one, you just really don't say, do you, of anyone. And if you were to say that one, Jesus says, you have to go stand before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the 72 elders of the Jewish community, and you would have to give an account for why you talk to someone like that. And then Jesus says... But I tell you, if you even call someone a fool, so now he's just using a normal everyday Greek word of their time. If you call someone a fool, much less offensive than Raka, you won't just be subject to the Sanhedrin, you'll be made subject to the hellfire. A much less offensive term, rendering a far greater judgment. You'll be subject to the hellfire. Hellfire, for those who want to know the Greek, the word is Gehenna. Gehenna comes from a place called the Valley of Hinnom. So we're just going to get some geography in for a second. The Valley of Hinnom was a, a valley or a ravine just south of Jerusalem. And in the history of Israel, what happened was the people of God started to get into idolatry with a God called Molech. And Molech required that you sacrificed your child to him. And God detested Molech so much and hated him so much that when King Josiah came along and saw the practices, he went and burnt and pulled down all the stuff. He threw it into the valley. And then, according to the history, 
They used that valley to go throw all the dump and trash of Jerusalem into it. And Josiah would even put wicked men to death and throw their bodies into there, not even bury them. And then they torched the place from time to time to burn down all the gross stuff. And then the prophets come along and the prophets say, if you want to know what hell is like, if the eternal torment is like, go look at Gehenna. Go look at the fire. Go look at the trash in the valley. That's what it will be like for the wicked. And Jesus is saying here to you and I, the insults that you do to one another, it's not the insult as much. You have a heart of murder inside you. That's why you're insulting them. And he says to you, you are made subject to Gehenna. You get thrown in with the wicked into the fire that never goes out. And so we have to ask ourselves, brothers and sisters, do any of us hate one another? That's what Jesus is confronting. Now, we're all good Christians, aren't we? Oh, I don't hate anyone. Far be it from me to be so horrible to say that I've got an enemy. You know, Christ is quite happy to say you got enemies. Pray for your enemies, he says. I think you're being too religious to think that you don't have someone that sits on the other side of you. And I want to work through and show that to you. Let's look at some practical facts. I don't hate them. I just don't want to talk to them. I don't, I don't hate them. I just love hearing off the lips of others their downfall. I don't hate them, but man, I cherish talking about them in a horrible way. Tell me, with that person that you apparently don't hate, what's the difference between them and the person that you do hate? Because if you're treating them exactly the same, tell me, brothers and sisters, do you hate them? Yeah, you hate them. It shows in the practical fruit that you're bearing out in the way that you communicate or do not communicate to them. You don't have to justify yourself. They started it. You don't have to excuse yourself. Well, I'm only like that because blah, blah, blah. Like they're all excuses. The first step in repentance is owning the guilt of the sin that you are doing. But you must own it. If you hate your brother and sister, own it before the Lord and confess it to him. If you don't acknowledge your sin of hate, you're going to justify yourself before the Lord. You're going to believe you're right with him when in fact what you should be doing is being on your knees before the Lord and saying, yes, Lord, I've hated this person in my heart and I don't want to hate them and I want to make it right again. If you hate them, confess it. 23, Jesus provides the righteous path for us that we must take when hatred exists between brothers and sisters. Look with me in verse 23, a bit down there. He brings up a scenario. He goes, look, let's say you're going to the temple. The temple is the church where you go and worship, and you're going to go worship God. You're going to offer your sacrifice. So you got your sheep, you got your goat with you, and you're coming into the house of the Lord to celebrate and give thanks to God who forgives your sins and reconciles you back to him. And you're going to come in and worship and go, God, I thank you so much that I have a relationship with you because you forgive me of all the wrongdoings that I have done. And in that moment of worship, you remember, or it comes to you, actually, my brother or sister has something against me. So notice the shoes on the other foot. You're not the one that's angry in this scenario. Your brother or sister is angry because you've done something against them and you've offended them. So when you feel that someone is cold shouldering you, when you feel like someone is not talking to you any longer, Jesus says, well, go to them. They might be angry at you. Maybe you did do something wrong. Leave your altar, leave your, worship, uh, your sacrifice there. Go to them. That's the equivalent of saying to you today, don't come to church next Sunday and worship the reconciliation of God and what he's done for you until you've gone and found that brother that you hate or that hates you and make it right with them first. Don't go to church next Sunday. 
Why? Because the reconciliation praise that you want to give to God, God, we're so reconciled through Jesus, is hollow in that you don't give two stuffs about being reconciled to your brother or sister. And the greater work that God would have you do, the true worship that God would have you do, is go find them, be in harmony, and come to church together and worship as one. So then practically speaking, it's not a question, do you hate your brother or sister? We shouldn't even have that thought in our mind. The thought should be, do you love your brother or sister? Because that's the command, to love your brother and sister. Do you love your brothers and your sisters? How do you know? Because you will go out of your way to reconcile the relationship that is lost. I want to make a few application points here for you. Firstly, Christ commands that we approach the one who holds something against us. Now I'm going to stretch the text just a little bit here. Not that it's not there, but I'm, I'm, I'm probably reading a bit here. In this scenario, the one who is guilty of the offense, they did the wrongdoing, they're at church and they're worshipping. And it looks like, and this is where I'm possibly reading into it, the one who was offended the one who harbors a bit of anger towards you for what you did to them, is not at church, worshipping. They remained at home. So I just want to ask the question, how many people are not glorifying God and His reconciliation work for them on account of what we did to them? How many stumbling blocks have we put up in front of people and cause frustration with them, that that's why they're not in the house of the Lord, praising Him with us. When really it looks like they should be the ones worshipping, and we're the ones who should be out making something right. You know, our fleshly nature, when this kind of stuff happens in relationships, we want to go, well, if they've got a problem, they can come bring it up to me. Don't we? Well, I didn't mean what I said the way I said it. Jeez. And there's some truth to that because in Matthew 18 it says, if you're offended by your brother and sister, it is your job to bring it up to them. But guess what? We're in a broken world where people don't want to do that. And Christ knew that. And that's why he said, when they don't do that, guess what you can do? You can love them and you can go to them too. It's a two-way street relationships. God wants his people in the house worshipping together in harmony, not hating each other in their hearts. The second application I want to make is this. Don't justify your verbal hate by dressing it up. We can do this in all kinds of ways. I'm just going to give two. Sometimes it can be done in the holy demeanor, right? We gossip, we slander, we, we throw around some insults. Well, you know, Ray... I'm just going to use Ray, the elder. I've heard about Dan. Dan's a close friend. He'll get it. And I just want you to know he's a stupid idiot. He uh, lost his license. He didn't lose his license. And I need you to know because I know you look after him. But really, I'm just wanting to share the hot goss. I don't actually care about Dan. I just love the fact that he fell. But I'm happy to dress it up and be like, no, someone needs to check in on him. If you've been in Christian circles long enough, you know that that happens. Second way you can do it, and this is more speaking to the culture, we Australians are really good at this one, and I learnt this with very close friends of mine. We love to address up verbal hate with (laughs) humour. Couples are really good at this. You know, we just chip and we're like, ha, ha, but we mean it. (laughs) And we all know we mean it. And they know you mean it. And the thing is, with our culture, you're not allowed to say anything. Because if you bring it up and go like, there's something in that, well, take a teaspoon of cement, won't you? Harden up a little. It's just joking around with you. But really, you're just criticizing And the Australian culture just loves to use humour to dress up the hateful speech that they do to one another. (laughs) I mean, mate, he just hates me so much through humour. It's malice in disguise. My last application on this section of text is, let's not get over spiritual 
over spiritual to the point that we're not even following what Jesus says to practically go and do. You know, sometimes we hurt one another as Christians. We know that we've done the wrong thing. And we go, well, I went to God about that and he forgives me. And then we don't go to our brother and sister. Brother and sister, if you went to God about that, God says to you, here, go to them and ask for forgiveness. Don't go over spiritualizing it. You did something wrong, go to the person you wronged and say, hey, I wronged you. And make it right, because that's what God the Father says to go and do. Yes, you need to ask God for forgiveness. I'm not saying don't do that. But if you went to God, God says, go to the person you offended and make it right. Fulfill the righteous command of Jesus. Go to the person you've wronged and get rid of the hatred and the malice that exists between you and them. The goal is reconciliation. In verse 25, Christ now brings up a court case. So he's changed the scene now. He's brought up a court case of what's going to happen if you and I don't do these things, if we don't reconcile with one another. And so this next teaching in verse 25 is prompting you and I that we need to act with immediacy with one another so as to not let division seep in and then you and I have to go stand before the Lord on judgment day and someone holds an accusation against us. So this person that was the brother or sister, all of a sudden Jesus is using a new illustration, but he's saying now you've got an adversary. What that means is that the word adversary means you've got someone accusing you. And their accusation that they're bringing against you in the court of God's courtroom is valid. So you have done wrong and God's going to acknowledge that you've done wrong against them. Again, the shoe is on the foot, other foot. You're not the one that's angry. The other person's angry with what you did to them. So while a person might go to hell because he's angry with his brother or sister, not doing the righteous works, there's a person who is subject to the hellfire who does not reconcile with the brother or sister who they legitimately made angry. In fact, God is on the side of the one who is upset because they're upset with a proper cause. Now, Again, culturally speaking, we just love to be offended. I've talked about this before. There's legitimate offense and there's illegitimate offense. Don't go being one of those people that every side glance, you're like, I'm offended. I don't just think those things hold up. Legitimate offense. I want to bring up something here because I think it's important in the scripture. When we get back to the section in verse 22... But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. There's a little note in there, if you got your Bibles. And it's not going to be written on there. But in other texts of the Bible, it says, But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister without cause will be subject to the judgment. And I'll tell you why that's important. And I want to start with murder. I think that this is in there because in the law of murder, we generally go, you shall not murder. That means you shall not kill anyone. That's not what it meant under the law. Because the law of Moses actually sanctioned that you kill some people for the guilt of their sins. So murder does not equate to just the killing or the taking of life. Murder is the taking of innocent life that you shouldn't have taken. That's what murder is. I'm not going to make a case about murder and should we have all that kind of stuff. I'm just making another point about anger. My point to anger is this. Sometimes to be angry because of injustices is not always wrong. It's quite a normal response to things gone wrong in the world. It would be really weird, actually, if your whole family got murdered and you're like, praise the Lord. I would expect that anger should rise up within you. It is a sin to be a hateful person? Sure. It's a sin to be an angry person, always upset at people, even though they've done no wrong? Yep, that's sin. But Scripture says, look, you must be slow to anger. So there are times when anger isn't going to be the wrong thing. But it does also say that human anger does not lead to the righteousness of God. 
Some of you are angry. This is why I say that as a glance. Some of you are angry with what people have done to you and legitimately so because it was wrong. It's not an excuse to live your life in anger and in bitterness and in rage for the pathway is to forgive your enemies. But it is an acknowledgement to you to say that God understands anger at injustice because he gets angry at it too. But it is not our job to take vengeance upon the ones who hurt us. As Roman states clearly, do not take revenge, my dear friends. Leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. God's going to sort out all the offenses in the end. God is going to vindicate all the innocent in the end. And we are not to let offenses and hate cause hate within us. So I say all this to a warning to those who maybe don't feel hate towards their brother and sister, but have agitated hate in their brother and sister through what they did. God's not on your side on that one. God is actually on the side of the other one. You know, in verse 25, I was having a read of this and I couldn't have a, a bit of a giggle at the scenario here. You know, people will say, you know, spiritual people that kind of just blend all the religions together. You know, at the end of the day, all paths lead to God. Yeah, it's true, actually. Yeah, everyone's going to go stand before the Lord. <laughs> You're all going to meet God in the end. Jesus says, look, all of us are walking towards the court. My question is, when you get there, what's the verdict going to be? What's the rendering of God going to be? If you harbor hate in your heart towards a brother or sister, or you allow it to well up in others for what you've done, God's going to condemn it. And then Jesus says, and you're not going to get out till you pay the last penny. And in prison, you can't make a buck. You're locked up. What Jesus is wanting his disciples to do here, sitting on this mountain, preaching this word. Turn from your hate. If you've got hate and rage so far embedded into your heart that you don't even know how to get rid of it, get prayed for. You got a yoke, you got a bondage, you got something so hard in there that will not come out. Only the power of God is going to yoke, uh, unyoke that thing from your life. And we're not to delay it because the reality is if you go to the Lord with it, what will he say? God has brought reconciliation to you through Christ and Christ commands that you do the reconciling work of him with your brother and sister. Now, I read through this scripture or my sermon, sorry, with a couple of people and it left a lot of confusion. Maybe it's the way that I'm saying it, but I think it leaves confusion in the scenarios that I know that are probably popping up in your head over certain people because the reality is, is that life is a lot more complex than the remedy that scripture gives. Not that God's word isn't sufficient in being able to handle it, but we are so sinful that so rarely do two people obey it. We normally just want to keep fighting each other. So I want to share a story and I want to share a few scenarios. I once had a brother in Christ that I so badly wanted to be reconciled with. And I'm a classic sorry person. I used to be, I'm not anymore. If, if there was a problem and it wasn't my fault, I just say sorry anyway. I was like, you know, I can just say sorry and then we just bypass the whole problem of having to confront them. Just so you know, if that's something you do, that's not good. That's not true reconciliation. In true reconciliation, everyone goes to the Lord's table and takes accountability for what they did. You don't take accountability for the sins that you didn't do. They're not yours. The guilt isn't yours. That's actually how you get subjugation. That's how you end up with an abusive husband over a wife in a Christian marriage because the man's going to just sit there and go, well, it's all your fault. And she goes, yes, darling, it is all my fault. No, it's not. Probably most of it was his fault. He just doesn't want to own it. He's just going to shift the blame. You can go vice versa as well. I'm just using that as an example. But I had this friend and I wanted to be reconciled with him. And every time I tried to get to that table, he'd perpetually bring it back up. He'd hurt me all over again. And what I was trying to do was the scriptural thing that's brought up here in this passage and in Matthew 18 of how God says, here's how two brothers come back together. 
And the more I did it, the more pain it caused, and reconciliation never happened. And actually what it did is it caused a greater chasm between me and my brother. I then went to a conference not long after this, and I was bawling my eyes out for days over this friendship. I went to a conference and the guy spoke on these exact passages. And so beautiful was the word of God preached and so powerful was it in what we are supposed to do. But in reality, when I tried to live it out, it looked horribly nothing like what he preached. Again, not that it, the word was insufficient, not that his preaching wasn't right, but because there was sin all through this process. You see, when I say the table's not your table and it's not my table, it's the Lord's table, reconciliation has to come the right way, God's way. It has to have the sins of both parties brought to it to acknowledge these are mine. This is my guilt of what I've done. And this is yours. And we're going to forgive each other. I'm not going to take on yours. You're not going to take on mine. And I'm not going to sit there and go, it's all your fault. And until you're ready to acknowledge it's all your fault, don't talk to me. That's blackmail. That's not reconciliation. Another scenario is some people, like this brother of mine, you can be obedient to reconciliation as far as that other person wants to go. As far as you are able. If you were sinned against and harbor anger, you are to forgive them and you are to approach them to give them forgiveness. If they don't want to acknowledge their sins, you can't reconcile. Their sins are still bound to them. You can live in a state of forgiveness so that they know that they can come back. But until they're ready to recognize that their sins are upon them, they don't have forgiveness. Furthermore, if you're the one that did the sinning, you're to acknowledge that you did it and take ownership. Again, don't take on the guilt of what they did, but take your own guilt, reconcile it by talking honestly and taking accountability where you did the wrong thing. So then they bring up and say, this is how you sin to me, and they're right, you must ask for their forgiveness. If you want to hold on to it and go, no, it's not mine, and justify yourself even though it truly is yours, now you're in the wrong. And lastly, if either of you go to look to the other for forgiveness and you refuse to forgive them, what it means is you don't want to do the reconciling work of God. You want to hold on to the hate in your heart over doing the work of the Lord. And the Lord condemns that. Now, I can't cover every scenario, and I know that even relationships are more complex than this. But my point is you must reconcile as far as you are able to with that person. You know, this is what Christ does for us. And this is where I'm going to end it today. Christ has come into this world to reconcile you back to God. There's an issue. And the issue is your sin, your guilt. And Christ came down and he took personal risk in approaching humans and saying, you are not right with God and you need to take ownership for what you've done. And he went to his own people, the Jews, who were meant to be his brothers in the Lord and they killed him for it. Knowing full well that this was going to take place beforehand, it didn't stop Jesus from doing what he did to make sure that they would have every opportunity to come into relationship with the Father. Through him, some have acknowledged their sins and they walk with the Lord and they have the forgiveness of God and they're friends with God. And some are still not reconciled, but Christ has left that door open so upon them understanding, knowing and repenting of their sins, they can still have a relationship with him. But once they get to that courtroom, once they die, or once the Lord returns, you've come to the judge. And I say to everyone here that does not know the Lord, 
that has not come to faith in Jesus Christ, that is still unreconciled, if you go to the judge before you come to Christ and make peace with him, you will be judged. Gehenna. Christ has come into the world because God is willing to forgive you of your sins. But will you acknowledge them? He said repent, not as a slang to kind of throw around and get you all on edge, but to say that there is room for you in the kingdom of God if you would come and find forgiveness for your sins. So if you do not know the Lord, this morning is the day. Come confess your sins, get baptized, and walk with the Lord who loves you. The last thing that I want to say to everyone else who believes, I want to leave you with some words from Paul. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed and the new has come. Everything is from God. And he has reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. We want to go and reconcile the world to the Lord, don't we? We just heard about that in evangelism with what they're doing at the barbecue. But will you also do the ministry of reconciling your brother back to yourself? It's not one or the other. It's both. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He is talking to a church right now that hate him. And he's saying, you are going the way, the wrong way. And I'm appealing to you right now in the reconciliation work that I know in Jesus, be reconciled back to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ has come into the world to take your sins upon himself and that's what he did at that cross. And through him you are able to receive the righteousness, the perfection that is required for you to come into the kingdom of God. And I ask you again, and I say to you again, the Lord is willing, if you are willing to come to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are prone to sin. And we're prone to stumble. But you call us to righteous living. And we might want to look at these commands and think they're too hard and they're too high. But Christ lives in us. And though it might be impossible for a man to walk it, it is not impossible for you. Place within us more faith to believe that you can do this work in us that we might fulfill the righteous commands that you have given us this morning and this afternoon. Give us faith to believe that you, Lord, by your power and your grace can remove these hateful stone hearts and make them beat again. In love for you, in love for one another, and in love, most importantly, Lord, for our enemies who hurt us. Holy Spirit, would you unyoke anything that is holding these people back from following you? Would you empower them and encourage them towards Jesus who calls them? And Jesus, you did not call us so that we would fall. You called us so that we would walk with you. And we can do that with you because by God's grace through the Spirit given to us, you are with us always. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. I'm glad you all showed up because uh, I remember 
the COVID years when I had to have a camera right there and I had to pretend there was an audience in front of me and it was the most awkward thing <laughs> in the world. So it's, it's nice having actual people uh, to talk to while we're going. Uh, but if you weren't here this morning, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus has called disciples to follow him. They've repented of their sins. They've gone through the waters of baptism. They're starting to follow him. He started doing the miraculous in their lives. And then he takes them up onto this mountain that overlooks this Sea of Galilee. And he sits down and disciples come forward, just like you guys are kind of coming forward this afternoon to re-listen to the words of God. And they sit down next to him and then he proclaims, what you now hear. So there would have been lots of people there, uh, but those who intently wanted to know the teachings of Jesus, they came and brought themselves forward and sat with him. And just a little bit of an overview, but he starts with the pronouncement of blessing that's known as the Beatitudes. And in the pronouncement of blessing, he's really tipping the whole religious framework upside down of everything that the people of the time knew about who God said that he favoured and who he said that he didn't favour. And so in the blessings, you get Jesus saying, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are humble. And these would be the particular people that you wouldn't think are blessed. Blessed means God's divine favour rests on this person. And God turns the whole thing around and says, look, if you're poor in spirit, well, God's favour is upon you because guess what? God's kingdom's rich in spirit. You know, if you've got a sad life or, or you live in sadness, you would think God's favour is not upon you. But guess what? God's kingdom actually is on you because in his kingdom, he's got joy that can meet the morning that you're in. And so the gospel is for sinners, actually. It's not for righteous religious people. It's for the sinful to find the Lord through the forgiveness of sins. And then through his good work in you, through the Holy Spirit and his righteousness that rests in you, you're able to now live out the commands of God. And that's the beautiful part, because for so long, people have been trapped in their sins before Christ, and they can't actually do what God wants them to do. But once the chains are broken, once you're liberated, once you're free, once you've come to the Lord, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's at work in you, and you can accomplish the good will of God. And that's the beauty of when you get to something like Ephesians, Two, where it says, you know, it is by grace, so unmerited favour, by faith, that you are saved. And this has nothing to do with yourself. All of it's a gift from God. So it all comes from God. And now that's the main part that we kind of hear in Ephesians 2. But then it goes on to say, you know, he has pre-planned good works in advance for you to do. So if you just walk faithfully with him... He will have the good works already lined up. They're already done. You don't have to make them up. You just got to follow in the footsteps of what he's doing and you will accomplish them because he's already got it all mapped out. We don't do random acts of kindness. We do God acts of kindness. He's already... We don't have to go striving for it. They will just take their form and their place as we become obedient and just walk with Jesus. So then we move over and we look at the next section when he says, you know, to the believers, to his followers, you are salt and light. And I went over that a bit this morning as well. But the salt, again, is that you are, you are the goodness here on earth that God just really enjoys and loves because you walk with the Lord. And you keep that with you. And you're also the light in the world in that Christ who is the great light. You are someone who can draw people to the goodness of of God, because that light now rests in you. And that's why it says at the end of that verse, hey, look, when people see the good works that you're doing, that is, as you become conforming more and more to Christ and his commands, people are going to see that stuff in you, and this is outsiders, and they're going to see, they're going to recognize the light, and they're not going to think you're awesome, they're going to think that the God that you worship is awesome, and they're going to come in and worship that same God that you have. And just through sheer obeying the Lord, you're an evangelist. Because they're going to go, whoa, look at the way that they just forgave me. Or look at the way that they're so kind to me even when I'm trash to them. What is it about them? And you're not going to go, well, I'm awesome. 
you're going to say, well, actually, the Lord has done this in me. He changed my life around. And they will go, there's something great about the God that they know. And then Christ gets to the next point when he's talking about the law and the prophets. And this is so the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there's confusion around his ministry because people think that he's just doing something completely new. And in one sense, Jesus does say, I am doing something completely new. Because he says, you don't put old wine into new wineskins, you, you put fresh wine into new wineskins. So it is a new covenant, we call it a new covenant, so it is completely fresh, but it comes from the old. It's just like your resurrected body, if you think about it that way. Your resurrected body will be from the old, seated in the old, but it's actually a completely new thing. And it even says that about the recreation, Christ is going to do away with everything here, but also it's all going to come from it as well. And it's kind of like that life, death, and then new life, like a seed getting planted in the ground and then growing up. <clears throat> but he gets to the end of this little section when he's talking about the law and the prophets, and he says, look, I've come to fulfill. And as he's working through the confusion that exists, he starts to go, look, you can't walk like the religious leaders of your time. If you look to them for their teachings and if you follow them according to their teachings, what's going to happen is you're going to end up where they're going because they're not going in the right direction. So let me reinterpret for you the righteousness of the law. This is Jesus, not me. Let me reinterpret for you what it was supposed to do and then follow in that. And then your righteousness will surpass that of the Pharisees because you're walking according to how the law should have been interpreted and then apply it into one's life. And so as we saw this morning, do not murder wasn't to just sit there and go, okay, we're trying to mitigate murder. Jesus actually turns the whole thing around and says, the whole point was that you loved one another and that you got rid of hate and animosity between you. That's what it means to do the righteous work of God. And we know that already because the righteous work that God wants you to do is to love your brothers and sisters. That's, that's the work. And he says everything hangs on that. And so now we've gotten through, through murder or the, the sin of hatred in our hearts towards our brothers and sisters, and now Jesus goes down to the next one, which is adultery, which is what we begin on now. And just, I'm going to talk through just some basics, but adultery, we mostly think of, well, that's when someone has sex with someone that isn't their husband or wife. That's the common way, but actually adultery in the way that Jesus kind of means it here, well, and he's going to show us that he means it here, is it's to have sex with someone who isn't your husband or wife. It doesn't matter if you're married or unmarried, and it doesn't matter if they're married or unmarried. You don't sleep with someone that's not your wife or your husband. Otherwise, you are, what Jesus says, is an adulterer. So the marriage part doesn't matter, and so I'm not going to talk on marriage too much in this section until we get to the divorce section. So in, in, in Jesus' terms, he says, look, lust is adultery. So therefore, someone who keeps going back to porn is in adultery. Married or unmarried, it doesn't matter, you're in adultery. Now, <clears throat> adultery just means that something's adulterated, you know, it's defiled. For instance, if you, I don't know, have alcohol and then you pour water into it, you've adulterated the alcohol. You've defiled it. You've made it a corrupted thing. That's what adultery is. You're corrupting something that's actually really good, and Christians should have healthy views on sex, but you're adulterating, you're defiling it in a way that God never intended for it to happen. So when you have adulterated sex, you're defiling the person you sleep with, you're defiling your own body, and you're defiling the sex act itself that God has designed for man and woman to enjoy. So as I said, I'm not going to talk about marriage until we hit verse 31, because it's not until verse 31 that Jesus then explicitly talks about marriage and divorce. But here in verse 27 and 30, if you have a Bible or your phone or whatever, you can read with me. But he is specifically talking about adulter uh, yeah, adulterated sex and how this law was to point forward to a righteousness that the disciples would have. They are to fulfill the righteous commands of Jesus by being faithful 
to God. If you look at your point with me, point two, if you've got your little leaflet, the righteous, that's you who have been made righteous on account of Christ, you are to fulfill Christ's faithfulness. Christ was completely faithful to God. Now, you might expect, well, shouldn't it be actually faithfulness to my partner? But I just said that adultery is not dependent on whether you're married or not married. Adultery is you choosing to have your sex life that you want, whatever that might be, over keeping the command of God to love him above all else. And I want to explain that for you. In Colossians 3, 5, it says this, Therefore put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. So Paul, who wrote that portion of Scripture, he said, look, here's a list of things that belong to the old person that you were before the Lord came by the power of the Holy Spirit and changed you. And some of the things that you have in you, and he labels them, he says, sexual immorality, impurity, and lust, and lust is what we're talking on this morning. But after he gives them, he says, these are idolatry. So for us to choose something over the Lord, idolatry is just to choose something over the Lord. You've decided, I'm not going to be faithful to God, I'm going to be disloyal to God, and I'm going to choose what I want, and what I want, in this case of what we're talking about tonight, is lust, can be greed and other things, but I want this more than I want to do the will of God. What you've become is an idolater through adultery. As Jesus makes it clear in verse 28, if we move on, he says the heart or the root cause of adultery is lust. Why do people fall into adultery? And now I'm talking about actually physically having sex with someone that isn't your partner. Well, it's because you have a strong desire. The word lust just means strong desire. And in this case, you have a strong desire to have sex and then you're doing it and God is prohibiting the act that you're taking because it's not your husband and wife. So any person, male or female, who desires in their heart to do this and gratifies that desire is fixating on a pleasure has committed adultery. Now, we must distinguish between the lust of, of the burningness in us that we know is wrong and just the temptation that, that comes along into the mind. You're going to have temptations all the time. At the end of the day, God has designed all of us to be the majority of us, I should say, there are anomalies, to be sexual beings. And that's okay. That's, you don't have to be like, oh, I feel sexual. That's okay. But with that, you're going to get defiled thoughts into your head that want to commit into acts or into ways that aren't godly and they're not good for you or good for the person that you want to do it to. Now, the verse can be also interpreted, which is really interesting. I'm not going to get into the Greek, but that verse can be interpreted in two ways in 28. Jesus can be saying, I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So what it could be saying is, look, if you look at the woman, obviously this is a very just normal reading, man, if you look at a woman and you, you're checking her out, and it's all getting inflamed in your chest, like you start meditating on it, well, that's lust. And that lust that you've committed to in your mind and is, and is fervent in your heart, that is the heart of adultery, and that's what's condemned. But it could also be read differently, and there's quite a good case to say that it could be read differently, in that it could be translated to say, look, when you... When you go after a person, after a woman, so as to create lust into them. So it's a completely different rendering, but it has a lot of truth behind it. So what you're trying to do now is you're walking down the street, I don't know, maybe you're like jacked or something, and you're trying to get someone to look at you in a way that you're trying to create a seduction in their heart so as to make them cause or stumble or whatever. Now, I'm going to do some stereotyping here of men and women. It's not true. It's not kind of the big broad brush, but I'm going to do a big broad brush because generally there's truth in it. So I'll speak to the kind of the man side and then I'll go to the, the woman side. Man, I, I don't think it's hard for us to know in our heart of hearts and in our mind when, when lust is lust. The difference between uh, the passing look and then going, should I double take? <laughs> or, or should I just keep my eyes going straight forward? 
that second glance or that lingering eye, you know, you, you might go unnoticed by everyone else, but the Lord God sees what you're doing. Now, Jesus isn't saying to, to men, look, you can't look at women. <laughs> Just look at them like a normal person and don't try to fulfill your sexual desires over her beauty. That's what it's saying. Because both men and women, they are made beautiful. And they're made beautiful because God is beautiful. We are made in his image. Obviously, you're going to find the other beautiful. Now, the culture is speaking against us so hard in this area, especially for a lot of Christian men, that to look at beauty is to think, I have to sexualize it. Because you are beautiful, I need to be sexually charged towards you. And it leads people into kind of nasty thoughts. But you don't actually have to sexualize beauty because you're not an animal. And in fact, animals don't even act like that. So don't be like the culture around you that says, okay, look, well, you find this guy beautiful or you find this woman beautiful or you find this part beautiful and whatever. Therefore, let's try to have sex with it. That's, that's what the culture will tell you. So let women be beautiful, let men be beautiful as they are told to be beautiful and don't objectify it to seek your own gratification out of it. My wife once, uh, when we were watching a movie <clears throat> and it's got this dude in it and I know that she finds him very handsome. And while we're watching the movie, I looked at her and I said, hey, babe, I'm better looking than him, hey? And she's like, sorry, you're not. <laughs> I'm like, oh, how dare you? <laughs> and she's like, Stephen, like, his job is to be good looking. Like, he's good looking. I don't love him, he doesn't have my heart, but he's better looking than you are. <laughs> that was a hard pill to swallow, but it's also just the truth of the matter. He was far better looking than I was, and we don't have to lie to each other and keep each other in this lie that we're the two most attractive people in the whole wide world. Because your, your, your sexual urges and your sexual desires don't have to be after someone that's prettier than your significant other. And we're actually going to get into that when it gets to divorce because there's some funny things that the religious leaders thought at the time. So, men, we have to acknowledge that there is in us something seriously flawed in us if we have to always look at beauty with an inflamed passion in our hearts. There's something just really wrong and off, and I'm not condemning you, it's just, it's force-fed to you from birth. It's just going to be ingrained. Now, if you struggle with it, just like we talked about this morning when I was talking on um, reconciliation and hate in your heart, if it's something that's just such a pandemic in your life or it's so repetitious, you come to the Lord in the same way. You come to the Lord in an acknowledgement of what you're doing or have done or whatever, and you seek forgiveness, he forgives you, he cleanses you, you get back up, you repent, you don't walk back into it, you walk away from it. And if it's so bad that you can't get out of it, you probably need a lot of prayer in that area. Because there is freedom in it. Don't believe the lie that you might be stuck with it for life. Christ does not call you to something that you cannot do. You can do it because it's Christ in you and he will work it for you. Now to women, and I always feel funny, if I may be so bold towards you, and uh, I'm not a woman, so I don't understand all the women psyche that happens. I'm still trying to figure out Jess. But please just don't label me with mansplaining <laughs> because God's truth is no less relevant for you in this area. If the text were to read, so as to cause lust in the other then there's a lot that could be learnt here. Again, generalising because the lust can go both ways. But generally speaking, men lust after beauty and women lust to be beautiful or to be beheld as beautiful by a man. They like to know that they're desirable. Of course, it can be true the opposite way. 
But women, it's not unknown for ladies to dress and to act and to speak and to do what they can so as to entice the man into a sexuality towards you. Now, you may not want to even do anything about it. It's just the idea of knowing that you can captivate them and hold them with your beauty. Now, if you have that kind of struggle, that's wrong because you're creating or you're generating lust into the other person. It's much like hate. You can have hate yourself, but also God would condemn it the other way around. If you're offending people and generating hate into the heart of that person, it's the same here with lust. Whether you're the one that struggles with lust or you're promoting yourself in such a way so as to make people sexualize you because you want to know that you're beautiful. Again, before, I I just don't want to demonize beauty because, again, beauty is a good thing. Just like it's a beautiful thing if you're just naturally wise and that's the faculty that God's given you in your big brain, we can celebrate smartness. And in the same way, we can celebrate in a very healthy light beauty, physical attractiveness. And I also don't want to demonize romantic love, you know, when two young people are trying to figure it out on the road and whatever. Because the book, The Song of Solomons, and a lot of Proverbs is actually dealing with or celebrating just the fact that God made beauty in us and that we can have sex with one another. And so there is a celebration, actually, of sex in the Christian life and attractiveness to one another. It's not evil. There's a, there's a purity in a man wooing a woman and in a woman cherishing the fact that her husband or her man delights in her. That's, that's a good thing. But lust is... It's self-obsessed is what it is. It wants to take beauty and it wants to go, I want to use it for me and I'll corrupt it. So that's how you'll know it's lost. And it's the same the other way around. If you lust after the idea of someone wanting you, you don't actually want them. You don't actually want to give yourself to them. You just want to know that you could have them if you could. And it corrupts the person. So it has that corruptive quality. But love doesn't have a corruptive quality. Love always seeks the betterment of the other person above itself. So Christ commands his disciples after he brings it up in 27 and 28, and he says, look, at the end of the day, do you want to know if you've broken the law of adultery? Well, do you lust in your heart or do you generate that in other people? Well, there you go. You're an adulterer in your heart. But then in verse 29, which we're at right now, he, he shows warnings of what happens if you're just going to continue in it. And the reason he's giving you warnings, again, it's not to condemn his disciples. It's to say you need to get on the righteous path and I want to show you the way in which to get to it. So that's in verse 29. And the first thing that he brings up in verse 29, he says, look, if your right eye causes you to sin that is to go looking around lustfully, gouge it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, your right eye in Jesus' day, well, it just meant your best eye. So if your best eye, let's say the other one's blind, if your best eye is causing you to look upon things lustfully, Jesus is like, poke it out because you're better off just not having the eye at all. And the reason is, is because the eye, it absorbs in and it informs what you want to desire. What you take in through your eyeballs will inform your heart and then your heart will long after those things. In Proverbs 4, it says, my son, pay attention to what I say. Don't turn, uh, sorry, turn your ear to my words. Do not let my words out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. The eyes are on the word. The word is now being absorbed into the heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. So above all, guard your heart. How are you going to guard it? You're going to watch where you put your eyes. For everything that you do flows from your heart. What you desire is what you'll end up doing. Keep your mouth free from perversity. This thing speaks what's in the heart. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead, fix your gaze directly before you. So God says, fix your eyes on the Word, fix it on Scripture, fix it onto your Bible. 
A wandering eye is an eye that hasn't spent enough time with the Lord. I was going to put a quip in here about how you can wear sunnies so you can get side glances, but it didn't really fit. Well, this scripture verse is, is not calling for, if anyone wants to take this literally, I don't think anyone does want to take this literally. He's not saying, look, go ahead and mutilate your body to stop lust. If you read it literally, that's what it's implying. And actually, one of the old church forefathers called Oregon actually did that. He didn't poke out his eye, he he castrated himself to get rid of lust. But that's not what Jesus is getting at here because the fact of the matter is you could poke your eye out and you could still lust. It, the problem is a heart issue and what you need to castrate, if you need to castrate anything, is you need to castrate your heart. There's something wrong with it. And we castrate the heart, should use a different terminology, but we get rid of that fleshly desire by the Word of God and by His Spirit. That's how we remove these things out of our lives. But there's also some other practical tips of what you can do. Think about what your eyes look at that inform your heart. So if you're watching TV shows or if you're on your computer or you're on your phone or you're going through social media, you go onto the beach or you're hitting the gym and it's causing your eyes to start to gaze sideways so as to look at other things, the reality is Jesus will say you're better off not having TV at all if the TV show is going to lead you that way. You're better off not having internet, internet access if it's going to lead you down that addiction. Better not owning the smartphone than to look at the woman of adultery on the screen. If it causes the eye to lust, then physically remove either yourself from the area or remove it out of your sphere. If you know the story of Joseph, the, king wanted to, the king's wife wanted to sleep with him and to get out of the situation, he physically just ran away. And the reason that you need to run away or you need to cut these things out of your life is because Jesus puts the warning in here, lust can put the person into hell. And it doesn't put the person into hell. It says you'll get thrown into hell, which means that God is the one who is doing the tossing. So lust has the capacity, and please hear me very clearly, lust has the capacity to draw you away from God lead you in the direction, wrong direction and put you under judgment. That's what it can do. Why? Because you chose idolatry, you chose something over God. And God gave you a heart that desires Him and you chose to rebel against that heart that He gave you and walk back into your wickedness that you were no longer meant to walk back into. Now after that, the hand is brought up and again, read it with me. It almost reads exactly the same. There's some variation. If your right hand causes you to sin, again, the best hand that you have, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one part of your body than your whole body get thrown into hell. So just like the eye, just now like with the hand, but the difference is eyes inform the heart, but our actions, what we produce out here, come from our desires. We do what the heart wants. That's how we operate. That's how we work. So the seed is going to come in through your eyes. It's going to get planted in your heart. And then you're going to do the, the physical action. And James 1 says this. It says, Each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. So you're going to let evil desire come in. It's going to come in. And then you're going to get tempted and then you're going to get led away by the evil desire or the evil lust, because lust just means desire. Then after the desire is conceived, once you've allowed it to take root into your heart, it's going to give birth to sin. You're going to physically go out and do something. And when sin is fully full grown, it gives birth to death. What does sin do? Sin breeds death. Why did man have to go to hell? Because in the very beginning, he fell into sin and walked away from the Lord. Sin leads to death. I once sat with a man uh, at a pub 
and he, he was a Christian man, and he was telling me his story about how he came to be a divorced person. They both got married young, they were both Christians, but he, he was a footy player. And when he was on the footy team and they had a win or had a loss, doesn't really matter, I guess, but when they, they went out and celebrated, they'd go to the pub and all the boys obviously would be just trying to, you know, get with all the girls. And he was in the scene, but he could never be in the scene fully because he was married. But the reality is he knew in his heart he kind of wanted to, to be in the scene too because that's where the boys were and you don't want to be kind of left on the outside, I guess, of that. So he said what he started to do, he went, well, look, I started, I started dancing with them, with the girls. That's what I started doing. And he goes, and then, you know, as time progressed, just kind of the zing wasn't there. And so I, I started holding their hands and then that led to, like, putting my hands on their hips. Eventually I was kissing them on the dance floor. And before you know it, after just a couple of months, I, I was having sex with somebody else. And he goes, and I'll never forget, he said to me, Stephen, if you just said to me blatantly four or five months ago, would you ever cheat on your partner? I would have thought you were crazy. And he goes, but here I am now, five months later, and it's just little by little, little by little, the lust keeps on consuming. It keeps on wanting more. It'll keep going further and further and further, and it will destroy everything. It will take it all away from you. You think you're getting something out of that transaction, but it is actually stealing something away from you. If your lust has gotten to the point where you, you are physically touching someone you shouldn't, or they are physically touching you and they shouldn't, or you're just physically touching yourself and you shouldn't, Jesus says, chop your hand off. In other words, make it impossible for yourself to physically do something. If you're married and you struggled somewhere physically with sexual sins, don't go into spaces without your significant other. Don't stay up late at night waiting for everyone to go to bed so you can chuck on that TV channel you want. Don't take the technology into your room if that's the problem. Don't go out for a night on the town without either your partner or your friend with you to keep you faithful. Just don't put yourself into those situations where you know personally that temptation is almost so far great that I know I'm going to give myself into it. If you don't rid yourself of the physical lust, again, Jesus says, look, the whole body will go into hell. Chop it off. Proverbs 2 says about the adulterous woman or the one that keeps going back to this adultery. It says her house, talking about adultery, her house sinks down to death and her ways to the land of the departed spirits. None return who go to her, none reach the path of life. So follow the way of the good and keep the path of the righteous. For the upright will inhabit the land and those of integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous ripped out of it. So if you're going to choose adultery over following the Lord, you'll be cut off. That's what will happen. So either your hand and your eyes getting cut off or you're getting cut off. You're either defeating sin or you're just allowing sin to run rampant in your life. The lie is, is that you can't get rid of it. That's the lie of Satan. You can get rid of it because the Spirit of God is in you to cut it out. You know, how many Christians will tell themselves if the Word of God is going to help you in this fight and the Word of God will help you in this fight because the reality is when the lies come into your head, you're going to want to believe them and you probably will believe them and the only way that you're going to be able to fight them is actually you have the Word of God stored away in your big brain so that you can use the right verse to counteract whatever comes into your head. You know, and Christians love to teach themselves, well, I just don't tell themselves, I don't have time to read the Word of God. Now, you probably heard it said like, oh, you know, you don't have time, but look how much TV you're watching. Look, how, look at how much time you've spent lusting maybe on your phone or somewhere else. So instead of doing that, just pick up God's Word instead. You have a lot more of God's Word in you than all the messed up crap you got, got sorry, some messed up stuff you have in your head. You know, it's surprising is that we can kind of probably name all the Kardashians or maybe you can name all the sex icons of of your generation, but you can't name the Ten Commandments. 
Like, what is that saying about what we're feeding into our brain? We need to spend more time with the Lord. He is going to fight. You have to be humble enough to work with him in the fight. I just want to bring up one other thing. I was, just know that this sermon was going to be done in the context of a whole church, not just here. Uh, but if you're online, same thing applies. The state of the church is so bad with sexual immorality that it is known in the world to be more corrupt than the world is. And I'm talking on things like pedophilia. And the church is known as to be one of the worst entities in this, and we're supposed to be the shining light in this area. And I believe the reason that that happens is, is because sexual sins are treated with such shame in churches and such embarrassment that who would ever want to come forward and say they've got a problem in that area? So what you do is you double down on your hiding, you make it way worse for yourself, and then you fester in it and you just let it get worse and worse and worse and worse until you do have priests that are off doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing. And I bring that up because if you are in a state somewhere where you're doing something sexually illegal, report yourself. And I mean that. Have some years of your life cut off now instead of your eternity cut off later. I want to tell you a story on that real quick. Most of you probably know it. But a couple of years ago, and I'm not going to name names because I don't like smearing people, but there was a theologian who was well-known in Christendom, in the Christian world. He travelled the world. He was likeable by almost all the churches. He went to his death and afterwards it was discovered that everywhere he went, he just went to a masseuse and got what he needed off the women. And he went to his deathbed with that never came out, it never got confessed. And the reality is his ministry might have brought hundreds of thousands to the Lord. Who knows how many people know God on account of this man's ministry. But he potentially, and I'm not God so I can't judge him, but he potentially forfeited his own soul to have this life. That's why it's so important with sins to bring them out. And I've said this multiple times before, I don't mean just in your head go, Lord, I'm doing this wrong thing. Actually get it to come out of your mouth and give it to God. God knows what you're doing. He doesn't need you to tell him what he's doing because he sees everything you do. But he does tell you, verbalize what you're doing. And he actually says in Scripture, verbalize it to your brother or sister. Because how embarrassing is it? To say it to your brother and sister, this is actually what's going on. If I get down to the nitty-gritties, it's pretty disgusting. And so we have a tendency to want to hide it. We'll go like, oh, yeah, I'm confessing it to God. You're just keeping it in your head. Or maybe you're just confessing it to God actually verbally, but you have no intentions of actually any accountability. You're not trying to get out of it. The Lord knows that kind of heart. And that's why I say to your brothers and sisters, if you struggle in that area, actually confess it out to someone Make sure you trust them. You don't want condemnation. And hopefully the brothers and sisters here wouldn't do that to you so that they can pray for you and know where the situation's at before it gets any worse. You know, there's this sickening picture in Ezekiel and it's always stuck with me where God takes Ezekiel, Ezekiel's a prophet, and Ezekiel's not in his hometown. He's in a, he's in a country far away. He's over in Babylon. And God, the Spirit of God, which should have been at the temple, isn't at the temple. The Spirit of God has shifted and it's gone over to this prophet Ezekiel, who knows nothing about Jerusalem at the time because he's living in Babylon. And when the Spirit of God comes upon the man, God talks to him and he says, Ezekiel, I want you to come with me. And in a vision, he goes with him and he shows him the temple. And he goes, look inside my temple. And he looks inside the temple and you're just kind of in the inner court, not in the Holy of Holies. And in the inner temple where you're just meant to worship one God alone, they've got all this imagery up of all these other idols. And they're burning all this incense, idolatry, burning all this other incense to all these other gods. And he's like, they're profaning my name in my temple. But I want to show you even worse things than this. And then he brings them into the Holy of Holies to find that his ministers, the priests, 
just having orgies, having sex, whoever, doesn't really matter. And just no accountability. And God just looks at them and he's like, this is why I'm destroying everything. This is why I'm taking it all away. And it's that kind of level of disgustingness that somehow we have justified ourselves to still be in right relationship with God and just be living these abhorrent lives that were not made for God's people. This is what is to be cut off. And I say that story to you because God is going to come as judge and you've got a secret life. We all got secret lives. And by secret life, I don't mean the things you're trying to keep hidden. I just mean you have time alone where you're doing whatever you want to do. And God says, I'm going to come back and like a blanket over a bed, I'm going to pull the blanket back on your whole life. You're going to get na- you'll be naked on that day. I'll pull it all back and I'll have a look at it all. And what he expects to find with his people is he expects to find in their secret lives, because he's just about to preach on it, he expects to find prayer. He expects to find fasting. He expects to find the reading of God's word. He expects that he'll see devotion, because that's what God's people do in their quiet time. They devote themselves to God. But tell me, when he pulls back that curtain, is he just going to find depravity all through it? We have to be honest with ourselves. When he pulls it back, is he just going to find us grotesquely doing all these things that we've just somehow allowed to continue and normalized in our lives? And I just say this so forwardly because I want you to be confronted with it so it actually causes change. Christ didn't preach us and go, hope they obey me. He expected change. Lust is adultery, and it will be condemned as such. So that is the righteous, uh, in point two, the righteous fulfill Christ's faithfulness. What Christ is looking for out of you is a faithful devotion to him and to him alone. We move now then into the last point, which is that the righteous fulfill Christ's covenant. The righteous fulfill Christ's covenant. So let's look at that one, and now we move into marriage and divorce. So please note, marriage and divorce, not sex and lust. There's some crossover here, but we're looking at the law of divorce. Before we move into, okay, what is divorce? We first need to understand what is, what's marriage? What does God call marriage? Because we have our own concepts, again, that we've grown up with in the law of our land or the culture or what mum and dad displayed to you before or whatever. We all have that imagery of whatever it is. But what does God call marriage? And the first thing is Christians believe, because the Bible states it, that marriage is not a human concept. It's not a human construct. It was something that God designed and ordained at the very beginning of time in Genesis 1 through to 3 for a relationship between a man and a woman. In Matthew 19, if we were to skip forward a little bit, Jesus has a conversation with some religious leaders over divorce. And to bring up the purpose and the plan of marriage, what he does is he goes all the way back to Genesis and he quotes Genesis. And it's like, well, if you want to know what marriage is about, then just look in the Word. At the very beginning, God's already told you. And this is what he says in Matthew 19 when he's talking. He says, haven't you read? So notice here again, Jesus is fixing an interpretation error. He's not wondering, hey, Pharisees, hey, religious leaders, have you ever read Genesis? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, do you not understand Genesis? Do you not understand what it means when Adam and Eve were together? Haven't you read, he says, that he who created them in the beginning, male and female, also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When the religious leaders said, the the question that prompted Jesus to say this was the religious leaders asked Jesus, under what circumstances are men allowed to divorce their wives? And Jesus was shocked when he heard that. 
And the reason that he was shocked when he heard that is because it is the exact opposite purpose of what marriage is for. Marriage isn't made for divorce. Marriage is made for lifelong commitment. So why would you want to wonder? Why would you want to think about, hey, how can I get out of it? It just doesn't make any sense. Marriage was made for lifelong commitment. So he's shocked and he responds by saying those words that I just read to you. And he points out some basics. The first one is the basics of male and female. Yes, we have different laws on that, but the Lord would have it for male and female. What is more, marriage creates a new home. So it creates a new family. He says, look, the son's got to leave home, the daughter's got to leave home. The two cleave together and they become their own thing. In other words, for parents, you have to come to the terms with the fact that it's now their household. You're not to impede. They've, they've joined a new home. Not that they're not your child anymore, but they've got a new home that they've created. They're going to have their own children, and they've got to start to navigate their own way of how they're going to do things, and so on and so forth. A new family has sprung forth onto the scene. But lastly, and most profoundly, and this is the part that I want to get to, when Jesus interprets it from Genesis, what he says is, is that God joins the, ma- uh, joins the male and female together. Which is really interesting because when you read Genesis, it doesn't say that. It says the two become one flesh. And as we know, two becoming one flesh, it's talking about the act of sex. But Jesus looks back at the account of Adam and Eve and he goes, well, actually, God joined these two together. And then he says, so if God's joined them together, what humans are allowed to separate that? They're not. And the point that I'm getting to here is that sex and marriage are not the same thing. They're not synonymous. Theology can get really weird on this. For instance, when Joseph was engaged to Mary and he found out she was pregnant with the Christ, so he thought, okay, my wife's just went and had sex with someone else and the baby in her is not mine – It says that Joseph went to divorce her secretly. Now, why would Joseph, or how can he divorce someone, firstly, that he's not married to, and that he hasn't had sex with? Marriage is based, what the the basis of marriage is, God joins them, but it's your covenant, it's your vow covenant that you made at the altar. Till death do us part, Will I love you and you alone? To be engaged in Jesus' day was to be married. A covenant had been established. You, You hadn't gone and consummated the marriage, which was coming up. But when you were engaged, you had already made the vows. You had already betrothed to one another. I am yours. You are mine. And in time, we're going to consummate this marriage. So it was just as binding as a wedding. The difference being one was just in the vow, but the consummation was the final practice. So when a man and a woman present themselves at an altar to one another, they're doing what Eve and Adam did in the beginning. God created Eve from man, from his rib, and then he brought Eve to him because he noticed that man was lonely. He'd been looking at all the animals. It's a real Tarzan scene. You know, Tarzan's sitting there and he's like, oh, none of these look like me. I don't really know where I belong. And then he sees this beautiful girl at the very end of the story. And he's like, oh, that's my animal. Women, you're not animals, but that's my kind. It's the same story. He's, he's named all the animals and he's done his job that God gave him to do. And God looks at the man and he sees that he's lonely. And it just shows the general thing that we like partnership we like fellowship we like to be with one another and so he creates eve from the side of adam but then he presents her like the father that's why we have the father you know trot the woman down the father comes and brings her to him and then adam speaks to her and it's the only time that you ever hear adam speak you never hear it again and when he's speaking to her people say he's wooing her like it's a song But actually, he's pronouncing something. He's saying, you are from me. You are mine, and I am yours. There's nothing else 
that can be mine. You are mine, you belong to me, and I belong to you. And it's that scene of the altar to say, you're mine, or I'm yours. And all of a sudden, through this covenant commitment that's created at the very beginning, God blesses this union that's between Adam and Eve, just as he blesses the marriage of the man and the woman that come to the altar to make those vows, and he divinely unites them in a way that men aren't allowed to undo it, and that's why adultery is so bad, and now I'm talking about sex outside your marriage, because you are trying to break something that God has said, don't break it, because I joined you. There's two applications that I want to make on this. The first one is, is if you are married, you shouldn't be looking for a reason to divorce. The purpose of marriage is not to end up splitting. The purpose of marriage is to fulfill your vows. You know, promises are empty at the altar until they're fulfilled in the actions of what we do. As a pastor once said to me when I got married and afterwards he came, shook my hand and he said, congratulations, today you got married, but you have the rest of your life to remain married or to fill up in your marriage. So marriage isn't a one-time thing. We have a celebration for sure, but it's actually every single day you've got to wake up and be faithful to the vow that you gave to that person. The second application I want to make is if you're having sex outside of wedlock and you are not married, you shouldn't look to get married to cover up the fact that you're having sex. That's a really big problem in churches because you feel embarrassed, you feel shameful, people might make you feel embarrassed or shameful in church and so what parents want to do if they're Christian parents a lot of the times is they want to go, well, you're having sex, we need to cover up this thing because it shouldn't be happening. Maybe even the pastor wants you to do it. He's like, oh, look, you guys shouldn't be having sex together. So let's cover it up. What you need to do is just stop having sex and get married when you're actually going to fulfill your vow. Are you going to fulfill your vow to that person? Get married. But don't take God's holy ceremony of joining people together and destroy it by trying to cover up your shame. It's the same sins, it's the same thing as fornicating or anything else. Just expose it, tell the Lord what you've been doing, what's going on. Let him know he forgives you, he loves you. And then walk in purity and marry someone that you're actually going to dedicate your whole life to. That's the purpose of marriage. So marriage is designed by God. He unites them together for the purpose of fulfilling their faithfulness to one another. And sex, if you can believe this, man, sex is just a very minute element of the whole relationship of, of marriage. There's a lot more to it than just this one thing. But to take this truth to the highest possible fulfillment of what it's supposed to achieve because in fact it's supposed to achieve something so much more than just physical blessings of, of a family. What it's supposed to achieve is it's supposed to achieve the symbolic nature, it's not a symbol, it's a real thing, of Christ's love for the bride. So you would think, oh well when I think of Christ and the bride, I'm thinking about marriage. Like, marriage is there, and then that's how we come to the understanding of Christ and the bride. But actually, it's flipped around. God gave us marriage because it is a representation of Christ's love for the bride. Ephesians says this about marriage, and this is Paul speaking, but it's God speaking because it's his word. For this reason, so the same portion of Scripture, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then it says, but this is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. He's talking about how Christian marriage should work, and then he gets to the end of his thought and he goes, but I'm not actually really talking about marriage. I'm talking about the mystery that Christ has become one with the bride the church, God's people. 
So the cornerstone of faithful marriage is built on the solid foundation of Christ's unending faithfulness and love to the bride, you and I, who belong to him. So then through this lens, Jesus the Son left his father's household. He left his father's household in heaven. He came down to us and he became one with us in spirit when he gave us the Holy Spirit. He paid the dowry. He paid the down price, right, when he went to the cross. He paid for us in full so that we could be his forevermore. And he has promised you, I will be faithful until the end. My covenant will not break. I won't go against it. And it's that solid foundation that you have in the covenant of Jesus of what he's done for you that our marriages are meant to represent. I will love you until the very end. Now, Jesus does this with a wayward bride that loves to get in all sorts of filth. And yet he says, I will continue and I will continue and I will continue to love you. Jesus says to them, <clears throat> or says to the Father in a prayer, he says, may all of them be one. So you and I, may we all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. So Jesus sees here, he sees when the Holy Spirit comes and envelops or comes into our lives, all of a sudden we're in a oneness we're in a union, we're in an intimacy much like that of a husband and a wife in the intimacy that they have. And so that intimacy that we have with God, again, and that closeness and that proximity is meant to be displayed in our marriages to one another. So that's what marriage is to one another. So now that we have that understanding, I can talk on divorce. Divorce, the word just means to let go or to untie, or it means to take the yoke off. So if you had, you know, two oxen plowing the field, you would put a yoke over the top of them, that timber bar over the top of them, you tie them together and then they can plow the field and they help each other plow the field. And that's kind of, you yoke together with your, your other person, but to get divorced means I'm going to untie the yoke off you and now we can go our separate ways. Now, some of the things that you need to know of what Jesus spoke into, but Jesus was speaking into a Roman world in which divorce was rampant. Both the Romans did it all the time and even the Jewish circles were doing it all the time. And it's to the Jews that he speaks. And there were two major views on why people would divorce. And the word is indecent. If you found something indecent, that's how the scripture talks about it. If that you find something indecent, then you can divorce. And so the big question became for the Jews is what constitutes as indecent so as to be able to unyoke myself from my husband or wife? And there were two main schools of thought getting around the time of Jesus, the school of Shammai, and they believed that divorce was only permitted on the grounds of sexual indecency. So not adultery, but forms of different promiscuity, so for instance, dressing really attractively and showing too much off to get other people's attention, that would be a sexual indecency to this school of thought and you could have grounds for divorce. But then there was another school of thought, which is the school of Hillel, another teacher at the time, and he believed and he taught that divorce could happen for any reason at all as simply they're just not a good cook. Like they didn't make the food well, done. Another one, and you can, you can read these laws. That we still have these laws handed down to us today, and you can go read them. They're a bad cook, or the other really petty one was, there's just someone prettier. And you're like, well, you kind of pass your use-by date, I'll upgrade. And we want to have a giggle at it, because it is stupid. Like, we all see that that's stupid. But just stop and think about the fact that these are the Christian equivalents of their days legitimizing they're lost. That's what they're doing. That's how petty it got. And they thought they were still living righteously to God. I haven't broken the law. I divorced them over an indecency. And the indecency was 
my Vegemite toast didn't come out the way that I wanted. Now, there's two, two thoughts I want to give on this. It's the technicalities of theology, and it's just stupid. But there are two quick thoughts. The first one that you need to know is Jesus is talking to a people where the woman was the neglected one because they weren't allowed to do the divorcing. Divorcing was for men. And men were allowed to divorce their wives and only under special circumstances could a woman divorce the man because men were allowed in Roman culture, you're allowed to sleep around. That's fine. In the Jewish culture, it wasn't that way, but only the man could divorce. Actually, with the Jewish culture, you could sleep with the slave or you could go and sleep with a Gentile or something like that, and that was fine. But it was predominantly the men who did the divorcing. And secondly, what you need to know about the culture is that the women were the ones that weren't getting the work. So when they were neglected, they were left to, they had to find another man. It was the only way you're going to survive or you're going to sell yourself on the streets or you're going to become a beggar or something like that. But you were dependent, the female was dependent upon the male. So when a man divorced the woman, it was really like just handing her a certificate of the worst life ever. And it forced her to go and look for another man. So because the, the divorce side of things resided with the man, you can imagine which teaching won out in their day on which one they wanted to listen to between Shammai and Hallel. They obviously chose the more liberal one and men were divorcing women for whatever reason. I went to Italy once and they had this uh, platform and on this platform were these big round poles holding up this structure and there was about this much room between the pole that you could kind of skirt around and the water. And these men back in their day, they used to go off to war in their ships and they'd come back and if they thought that their wife had been unfaithful, they were allowed to, the whole town would gather together. What they would do is they would say, you have to walk, you have to walk this. And the reason that they made this up is because they thought if she's been unfaithful, she's probably pregnant and her pregnancy won't allow her to be nimble enough to get around the outside. And if she falls in, that proves that she was unfaithful way away. But what they came to find out later was it was to make sure that they didn't fatten up too much while they were gone because they wanted them to remain attractive. And this just shows the kind of the sickening side of the stupidity of why we want to get rid of our wives. And you can understand why Jesus is sitting there going, why would you get married? Why would you get married? If you're just looking for loopholes, why get married? Marriage was given for the fruitful love between the husband and the wife to fill up in the vows, to enjoy it. You know, Proverbs talks about it. It's just like enjoy the relationship that you have in this union because you're allowed to enjoy it as much as you want. You can have all the freedom that you want with you and your husband or wife. So why would you go the other way and try to think, how do I get away from this person as quick as possible? And that's because there's lust or adultery. So now what we're talking about divorce, and I just want you to hear me clearly on this. There is to Jesus and in teachings of Scripture, there is legitimate divorce and there is illegitimate divorce. All divorce comes from sin, but not all divorce is sin. Illegitimate divorce is something like, honey, we've fallen out of love. That's not grounds. Or oh, honey, you burnt the toast. We don't have the zing there anymore since the kids left home. These aren't reasons that you're allowed to undo what God joined. They are illegitimate reasons. Now, if you've committed the sins of illegitimate divorce, again, hear me clearly, you're not hell-bound. You did something wrong. You need to acknowledge it and ask the Lord for forgiveness in that area if you wronged your partner. 
or your previous partner. And so if you've done that, you need to bring that to God. What it also doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that you can't have a healthy, godly second marriage or third marriage or whatever. You can. God is a God of redeeming things. You can have the marriage. But what you can't do is you can't ignore if you've done the illegitimate thing of divorcing when you shouldn't have. But there is legitimate divorce that God speaks on or that Jesus speaks on, and this is what he says if you keep reading the part. It says, if your partner has committed adultery, then you're permitted. Now, that's not using the word adultery in the broad sense of lust, else you all could probably divorce each other whenever you wanted. It's using adultery in the sense that your partner has gone out and sought to get their sexual fulfillment outside wedlock. Then, under that circumstance, is it a legitimate reason to divorce? I do want to stress one thing here, though, with the word permissible. Jesus says, yep, under this condition... Except in the case of sexual immorality, yeah, you can divorce. But just because Jesus says, okay, under this condition, you can, it doesn't mean that you have to. Maybe they did sin against you in this way. It doesn't mean you have to follow that pathway. God can, through you, forgive your partner and work the relationship and bring it an even better pasture than maybe it was before. There are many marriages that are more beautiful after the downfall because what's had to happen is actually greater love had to be displayed in that unity. Now, other scholars will say that what Jesus is really saying here is not adultery in the sense of sexual immorality. He's just talking broadly on unfaithfulness to the covenant commitment for grounds for divorce. For instance... If you're being abused by your partner, sexually, physically, emotionally, whatever, then that's grounds for divorce. I just want to say, maybe that's right, but that's not explicitly stated. And so I don't teach it because it's not said. I'm not saying I've got it all right. I'm just saying I'm not going to propose that idea to you because it doesn't say it in the text except for the case of sexual immorality. If you've got those other things going on, sexual, physical, emotional abuse or whatever, for sure separate, like remove yourself from each other's presence physically, but don't try to spiritually undo the tie. Go get counselling, go get help, go seek out your pastor, do whatever you can to bring that back into a proper unity. But also what you don't do is if you've fallen into those relationships and you are tied to that person, and if it is a Christian one, don't allow religious manipulation to keep you shoved down in a marriage that you know is so hostile and wrong. Seek help, seek someone to talk to, find them and work it out because something really is wrong. And religious people do have a tendency to go, well, it's all your problem and you're not obeying God's word if you run off. And then you feel guilty, right? Because you're like, well, I don't want to let God down. Who wants to let God down? No one wants to let God down. I don't want to let God down. But I also know something so horribly wrong in the relationship that I've got here with you. Seek help. You don't have to stay physically with them. Get some space. Figure it out. Seek mediation. Seek reconciliation. And bring it back together. All right. The last portion of Jesus' teaching, after he gets to divorce, except for the case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And then he talks about remarriage. And I'll talk a little bit on that. Causes her to commit adultery. Whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So this is the last part. So it's talking about now remarriage. If a person has divorced illegitimately from their partner, so you shouldn't have divorced at all, 
and it puts their partner in a position to have to cling to another person, then the adultery is compounded. The sin doubles. You committed adultery and then you went on and you allowed them to go commit adultery. And, and the reason that is, is because in the eyes of God, you're still married. So you were still married, but you said, no, I'll give you the certificate of divorce. We're separated. But God's sitting there going, no, you're still married. But then you went off and had sex with someone else. They went off and had sex with someone else. Now you have broken the covenant. Now you have committed adultery. And now you do have grounds for the divorce. But the reason it's adultery, even if you separate, but it was illegitimate, is because God still sees it as adultery because he's the one that knitted you together. Now, for those who have been divorced and are living in remarriages, I've already spoken about it, but if you did the wrong thing, you sinned. Just take it to the Lord. And fulfill your vows now to the one that you're with. I get people say, well, I'm in a new marriage now, and should I go back to the old marriage, should I divorce that person, and go back, blah, 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 blah. You're, just, you're making big messes all over the place. Fulfill the vows to the person that you're with. Ask the Lord to forgive you for what's happened in the past. Fulfill the vow with the person that you're with now. <clears throat> but I say to those who are still in their first marriages, you shouldn't have a heart of divorce because it's just as ugly. What I mean is God wants you to fill up in love the marriage and the vows that you have. And what happens with Christians, again, sometimes is they become legalistic in their vows and in their marriage, and they might as well be divorced. Because honestly, you're showing as much love as if you just ran off and went somewhere else. For instance, you might sit there and go, well, I know divorce is wrong. I know God doesn't want me to divorce. So I'd never in a million years would I divorce, but you treat each other like garbage. That's a heart of divorce. You hate each other. I won't get divorce, but I'm going to be thinking about if you weren't here, how much better it would be. And what you're doing is you're doing the loophole thing of the Pharisees. Well, if I don't divorce, I'm not technically doing anything wrong. But you need to stop it. Because God did not give you the marriage to your partner to see how much you could not fulfill your vows. He gave your partner to you so that you can fill up to the maximum all of it. And that's why I think Jesus was so shocked because he's like, I gave you marriage to enjoy. To have it all with your partner. Whatever you so desire, you can just love all of it. So why are you trying to do the very opposite thing that I gave to you? So don't have a heart of divorce. <clears throat> I'll finish my time here now, and I'm just going to outro with this morning's talk as well. But Christ has come to show us the righteous way in which to walk. And he knew that even at this time and at this moment with these disciples that he had, that a lot of their lives, if not all of their lives, were broken in some way. They're all completely shattered. None of them were following this perfectly, but he's calling them to follow it. He's calling them to this way of righteousness. They've turned from their old lives. They're seeking forgiveness. And yes, they can see more sins in their lives because of what Jesus just taught. But he says, look, you know that you're forgiven in me. You can come back to me in forgiveness. But now walk this righteous path with me. And Christ calls you, disciple, to walk with him in this new way of reconciling with your enemies. That's from this morning. Why does he want you to reconcile with your enemies? Because God reconciled himself to you and you were once an enemy. You see, we like to think, oh, maybe I'm just a poor victim in the world. But no, actually, you were adamantly against him doing the will of the devil. And it wasn't until God stepped in and confronted you and he goes, you're my friend. I will make my enemy my friend. So you are under now or enabled to do the righteous work of God in reconciling now 
more and more people, not only to the Lord, but also all that damage that you've done in your life in the past, God has empowered you now to go and fix those things up. God calls you or Christ calls you again, disciple to the righteous path of being faithful to God. In all of Christ's affairs, whether he's in public ministry and he's doing all that stuff, whether he's with the prostitute that everyone's just about to stone on the ground, or whether he's having his alone time out on the mountaintop, or whether he's out in the desert getting tempted by Satan, what you will always find him doing is being faithful to God from the very public side to the very private life. And because Christ lives in you, the same Christ that never failed at a temptation, you too, in both your public life to your very private life, to going out to the pub with your friends who are getting smashed, to being in a situation where maybe someone is wanting to do something with you, you are able to stay firm. Why? Because Christ is in you. The righteousness of Christ is in you. Yeah, you can have victory. You might have to pluck the eye out and chop the hand off for a little while, but actually as you grow in strength in the Lord, you might just find yourself in those situations and he will make you strong to keep you faithful to him. Why? Because Christ was faithful to God in all things. Christ calls you again, disciple, to the righteous path of covenant faithfulness. Christ went to the cross knowing that his people who called him by his name would mess it up a million times over in their relationship to him. Yet he still chose to die. He still went to the altar. He still sacrificed and he still said, I give my life up for you, knowing that you're going to mistreat my covenant. But my steadfast love, but my faithfulness to you, it will remain. And so in your marriages, in Christ in you, let your faithfulness and your love to your husband and wife remain until death do you part. It's Christ at work in you. He didn't set up these laws for you to fail. He set up these commands for you to walk in the righteous fulfillment of everything that he calls you to. And as you order your life around what Christ is teaching here. You will shine. People will glory in God on account of you. I recently heard something. I wasn't going to share this one. I'm just going to share it now. And it was so gross to me that I couldn't continue on. It's not that gross, but it, it was gross enough for make me leave the room. Where I went to a seminar... And they were talking about the gospel. And this person says, look, they were talking the story of talking to someone else. And the person was a teacher, a teacher of the word. And they said, look, I had someone come to me and they said, who's, who's good enough for heaven? Oh, no, sorry, I said that to them. And this person looks at me and says, well, I guess no one's good enough for heaven because all have sinned and blah, blah, blah. And, and the person said to us, they went, you know what? And I looked at them and I said, now they're ready to hear the gospel. So I gave them the gospel. You're 100% right. No one is worthy of eternal life. That's why Jesus came to forgive you of your sins. And through his perfection, you can be made perfect and now you can go to heaven. That's what they said. Now, it's a beautiful, beautiful part of the message. And then the person rebuttaled and said, yeah, but, and without letting them finish the sentence, this person looked at the person and said, no, no, no buts. That's the gospel. Nothing more is needed. And then they went on and they said, you see, obedience doesn't do anything. It's a good idea, but you don't have to do it. Is that true? It's not true because Christ doesn't work in your wickedness. How can someone increase in wickedness and say that they have the righteousness of God? How can someone be forgiven everything and then just go, you know what? I'm going to be a worse devil than I was before. Scripture says that that's lawlessness 
John says, that's lawlessness. Now, we may not be under the, the, the Old Testament law of Moses, hallelujah, else you'd be doing 450 whatever commands, and who knows which one you've got to keep for that day. Praise the Lord. But does that mean I can just go into a, a life of whatever the hell I want? Because guess what, Lord, I'm saved. Thank you very much. And I think I'll just do whatever I want from now on. Of course not. He can call you to that. He called you to walk with him. And that's what we're doing in Matthew. Jesus said to them, follow me. Because you can follow him. And if you follow him, you will end up where he is. Where has he gone? He's gone to be with the Father. Do you want to be with the Father? Is that your yearning? Then follow after Jesus. I, the reason it disgusted me so much, this teacher of the word, where are all those people going? All the people that that person just where are they going? I don't know. It's not my place to judge them, but I know what they taught was horribly wrong. You are to follow the Lord. Jesus says multiple times in John 13 to 15, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commands. You will keep my commands. The reason you'll keep his commands is because the love of God is in you. And I just want to leave you with that because there's so many lies on this. And as I was listening to that person and I was reading through this scripture that we just went through, Jesus literally says, if you follow down these other paths and you decide to follow them instead of me, you'll guess where you're going to end up. And he's going to get to the end of this sermon and he's going to say to them, you guys call me Lord, Lord, and rightfully so because I am the Lord. But why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? Why do you do that? Because if I'm truly the Lord, as you profess that I am the Lord, then shouldn't you do what I say and follow me? And that's what a disciple is. Now, if you feel like the bar's too high, it's not too high. Christ gave you it to follow him. He'll do the work in you. And this is where prayer is so powerful. And this is where we see a lot of liberation and freedom. But you are made righteous to fill up the righteousness that Christ gets you to walk in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we all confess that we cannot do anything apart from you. That there is no good work in us, A, that can make us right with you, but there's no good work in us that we can generate in which you're pleased unless it comes from your hand. From beginning to end, we're in your hands. I pray for the people that have shown up tonight. Father, I pray for those that are sat online on YouTube. I pray for anyone that hears this message. That Holy Spirit, you would mold them into Christ that you would strengthen them in their pursuit of you. Father, not working under that burden of a human strain, but working from the freedom and liberation that you have brought, that they are blood-dipped and blood-bought, that they are clean, that they work out of the overflow of the gospel, that they obey out of the overflow of the gospel that you set us free, that you removed chains that kept us back from you and apart from the goodness that you would have us walk in. And now with full confidence and assurance and by faith, they can accomplish what you say to do because you're at work in them. So Holy Spirit, we rely on you. Christ living in us through the Holy Spirit, we ask, have your way and your will in us. Break anything that still binds us. Take away any foothold that Satan might still have yoked us with. And keep us walking in the freedom and the righteousness that you call us. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. No song. What do we do now?
<laughs> um, if you want to pray, that's one of my favorite parts to, to preaching. Um, I would love to pray with you. If you want to just talk with each other, you can talk with each other, you want to eat pizza, you can do as you feel led by the Lord. Um, but if you know there's just things that you need dealt with and you want to bring that out, I'm here. But you can talk to one another as well. God bless you. So encouraged by you all showing up and yeah, it's been wonderful. Thank you.